平行政院唐凤珍委员令会场。次的专题演讲，我们现在很高兴特别邀请到行政院的唐凤政务委员为我们演讲。今天的讲题是台湾社会创新发展趋势。那首先呢，我们就先请我们的引言人、筹委员会吕元龙吕副委员长为我们引言。有请吕副委员长。谢谢。谢谢我们的洪伟哈，给我亲切的介绍。唐凤政务委员刘汉成。学院长在那边，是我们的学院长哈，还有我们的陈新妮、刘冠廷两位副学院长，各位 f a s c a 的好伙伴们，大家午安，大家好。好。嗯，我想这样这样好了哈。首先我要代表小五委员会，要来欢迎我们行政院唐凤政务委员，那能够在啊他百忙的行程中间，拨冗来为我们 f a s c a 来给我们做专题演讲，那我想政务委员哈、啊，他是 Minister without portfolio， 是我们我国的部长哈、啊，那能够我们邀请部长来给我们做专题演讲，可见我们政府对于我们海外青年非常的重视。我可不可以邀请大家，我们再次给我们唐凤政务委员一个热烈掌声，欢迎我们的政务委员。这样。我们委员长说哈，说那你要来引言介绍一下唐凤政务委员哈。其实我觉得大家都在网络上都充分的啊了解，也看到了政务委员他在网络上或者在 Facebook 上哈等等有很多的介绍。那我仅就只能够很短的时间哈，我简单的给大家做一个说明哈。那唐凤政务委员是我们台湾第一位数位部长，就是 Digital Minister。那啊、呃，他是负责我们行政院哈、哦，要督导我们的数位经济，以及开发政府的发展，那创造行政院公共数位创新的空间。简单来说，叫 P D I S Public Digital Innovation and Space。那我想，呃，也就是说，透过我们的数位技术和系统来辅助公务系统解决我们公众的问题。同时，借由强化我们政府部门和公民科技、公民社团的对话。那我们，我想大家平常也都看到哈、哦，我们的唐凤政务委员，他早期不但是一个网际网络的专家，是一个创业家哈、哦，同时他也一直在推动促进我们的公部门以及我们民间的各个啊呃,呃民间的各个体系哈、哦，能够来促使我们公部门资讯的透明化。开放我们所有这些政府开放的资讯哦，在这方面能够来啊、呃，希望能开发更具有包容性、代表性哈，以及开放的一个民主体制的平台。那我我想这是对于我们一个政府的革新，或者说政府要能够更契合我们的社会，是具有非常非常大的贡献。那我也简单也跟唐凤政务员报告，我们的 f a s c a 是由我们在美国、加拿大。一共有十二个地区，有二十九位我们的青年伙伴啊，他们都长期在各地的侨社，不但是协助政府在推动有关于我们的，我们常说是我们的文化大使哈，来做各项的这些啊，介绍台湾的软实业工作，同时也直接的在协助推动我们的公众外交。这个公众外交哈，就是指政府外交之外的这些部分哈 ，public diplomacy。我非常感谢我们这些我们的年轻伙伴，他们有爱台湾的心，他们很乐意来跟我们的啊、呃，包括各地的我们的国际友人来分享哦台湾的美好。所以啊，今天呢啊，我们特别也借这个机会哈、啊，我们侨委会有邀请了在美国、加拿大各地我们 f a s c a 的年轻伙伴们，第一次他们到台湾来，然、啊、我们有有一个很好的大家的一个分享的课程哈。啊跟跟大家来介绍，当然我们里头非常精彩的一个就是大家一直很期待，就是我们的唐凤政务委员
啊，我们的啊，政委等一下要来给我们做分享。那我也期许哈，各位我们的年轻的伙伴，将来呢都能够成为台湾的亲善大使，能够来协助我们推动台湾的文化外交，能够让世界看见台湾，让台湾走向世界。各位好伙伴们，我要再一次要邀请大家。我们要用热烈掌声，我们一起哈、哦、，Please join me to welcome our digital minister， 唐凤，谢谢各位。谢谢吕副文长精彩的引言，那我们现在就欢迎唐凤政委为我们进行今天的演讲。All right, um, I'm very happy to be here, and I actually sing in English, so uh, please forgive me if I speak in English. Uh, I hope that it's okay with the, with the guys. Okay, it's okay. All right. So, um, um, as the digital minister in charge of urban government, quote unquote, and social innovation, um, I, I'd like to um, welcome you and uh, ask you to crowdsource uh, my agenda. That is to say, to determine what I will say. Um, if you do have a film that happens to work here in Taiwan, please bring it up. And um, if you don't, then uh, you can ask the people around you to uh, help you fill in the questions. So um, the, the idea, very simply, uh, is to uh, open your browser and go to this website, slido.com, slido.com. Uh, and once you're in this website, I will ask you to enter a code. Uh, you don't have to enter this hashtag sign. Uh, just uh, today's date, that's 704. 704. Uh, and after entering the three numbers, uh, you can press the green button, which is uh, join, I think. Uh, and then uh, once you're in the chat room, uh, this is basically a um, crowdsourced device for people to ask me questions anonymously. Um, I'm sure that if you have questions to, to ask, you, you wouldn't hesitate to raise your hand, but sometimes uh, it's better uh, if there is an anonymous or pseudonymous way for people to raise more challenging questions, and I want those kind of questions. So um, if, if you would like, you can say hi here, you can um, enter whatever you want to hear about here, and the newest uh, questions will um, arrive from the bottom. And if you see the question that you would also like to ask, then you can just press uh, like and the most like questions uh, will also appear here uh, in this uh, interface. So if you're in slido.com, uh, enter 704 uh, and join, and you can now try by you know saying hello or whatever and see uh, whether the um, uh, here you go right. So so somebody said hello, and and if you would um, also uh, look at that, look at that. <laughs> so so that's that's. That's pretty good. So, so then, um, based on the number of likes, the ones that has the most likes, as you can see, the one with one like, two likes, uh, will appear on the top, and then I will uh, talk about whatever things that you would like to, me to talk about. Um, and uh, we have about two hours, I think, uh, and then I'll just you know use whatever time is needed uh, to uh, address your questions. And um, also keep in mind that this is being live streamed, although. Uh, 
face on it and go with the camera only I'm being live streamed. <laughs> so if you would like to um, ask for a microphone and uh, have a more back and forth face face to face discussion, please raise your hand at any time and then we can engage a, a deeper or more real time conversation um, and uh, as you wish. Right. And if uh, you you guys run out of questions um, before two hours, then we just terminate this early. But that has never happened, so I don't think this will happen at this time. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, um, do you prefer? Uh, and if you're asking um, like Chinese characters, if you're asking Mandarin ni hao, then I na na wo hui da JT de shi hou zhu huan cheng yong zhong wen jiang zhe yang zhe. It's just to keep the language diversity, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so um, yeah, the Surprisingly, the top uh, question at the moment is: Do you prefer iOS or Android? Is there any reason why? What phone do you use as a as a daily driver? Right. So um, I actually have a range of devices. So, <laughs> as a digital minister, um, this this morning actually we we were we were just talking about. Um, the the um, healthcare card. Um, you perhaps know that we have a Medicare card here, uh, the Universal uh, Medicare, and the card, the EID card, has served us really well for the past 15 years. But now we're collectively reimagining the possibility for the next 15 years. So people were talking about a lot of things like building the card directly into the watch, uh, into the uh, phone, and then perhaps you know um, using. Uh, there's people even mentioning quantum computers, but there's also people. Um, uh, talking about the need uh, for people who are using non-smartphones, for people who are elders, who are people who are like very young and their parents, uh, maybe in their, their phone, they have to carry like three virtual cards of their three kids and things like that. So there's a variety of different uh, use cases once you imagine a health card that is completely digitized. First, you have to keep the existing card, but then you also have to adapt to the various uh, usage. Right? So uh, I do have this Apple Watch here, and you having the latest band, I believe. And then, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and the iPhone that goes with it, but I also have this Android phone, which uh, you will notice that usually only grandparents use. <laughs> the, the, this is what we call here Xiao uh, Qingji, right? To, to show your filial loyalty <laughs> so, so, so that uh, you can provide it. But, but I do find it very useful because the, the phone is really huge and it's very easy to just pick it up and without getting distracted by social media and stuff like that, right? So, so there is this use case here too. And then of course iPad and, and um, in my um, MacBook, but back into uh, Executive Yuan because for VR, I also use Windows and Linux as well. So as the digital minister, it's very important for me to not uh, restrict my use use experience to that one of this like hyper advanced or um, you know a bubble of uh, digital usage uh, because while in Taiwan there's like 80% almost 90% of uh, mobile penetration that like, people do use mobile phone a lot uh, they don't not they do not necessarily use it for all services right the actual services uh, that government provide even though like 90% of um, critical services and uh, like um, filing tax and things like that we do offer an internet enabled version, but uh, actually only about 60 or 70 percent of people actually use them. Many people still prefer face-to-face -face, uh, or like real-life uh, interaction. So it is essential for me to have devices of all ranges of different operating systems as well of different age groups so that I can, when, when we do a new service like uh, we collectively redesign our text phone experience this year, uh, we can make sure that um, <coughs> my uh, personal um, empathy uh, can work with people with different uh, age ranges as well as with different operating systems. So that was the um, reason I keep all these different ranges of phones and as a daily driver. So that's, I hope that addressed the question. So why are you wearing your SDG pins today? And how does the ROC government relate her SDG agenda with its use? This is an excellent question. Uh, so SDG, I'm sure that you know more about SDG than I do perhaps, <laughs> is 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is a new universal religion and uh, whatever uh, spirituality you practice, you can also practice SDG because uh, after a consultation with more than one million people worldwide, the SDGs um, are known for its um, coherence. The idea here is, is very simply that um, 
any goal or any sub goal that you work, um, the United Nations has uh, a very lengthy process of involving all the major groups, ensuring that whatever thing that you work decide to work on, it will not work uh, against the other um, major SDG goals. And that is this internal coherence that is the most the greatest thing about the SDG because that means that uh, people who work on MPO, work on volunteer programs, working on social enterprises, working on various environmental protection groups. Groups, whatever your um, uh, ambition, uh, you can work in a kind of um, overview effect to see that how your impact impact other groups without uh, worrying about that your uh, work is detrimental to other groups. So this is, uh, I think, the main uh, message we're giving out to our uh, young people here. Uh, we have this new plan called. Um, I'm sorry, we don't have an English translation yet, but it's called a Social Innovation Action Plan, and it's going to be approved, I think, a couple of weeks from now. And it's a five-year plan that basically um, says uh, something, um, I think, that's very fundamental. That is to say, uh, the SDGs collectively um, done and um, consulted uh, with all the people who are impacted um, on all those social and environmental issues and covering the whole range from the traditional for-profit to traditional non-profits and all the different spectrum in between. And so um, one of the consensus of the SDG is that if only government work on it in a traditional multilateral United Nations kind of way uh, and with the national uh, budget and the ODA budget, we can only complete uh, by the year 2030, I think uh, less than one eighth or something, like a small fraction of the SDG goals. So um, I think the main SDG message is that it's mostly about the private sector and the civil society. It's mostly about people like you uh, who don't full-time work in the public sector but do see very closely uh, your social composition and the thing that your uh, families and your communities care and actually take action to address those social needs. Uh, and those social innovators are now um, the main uh, driver of the SDG and uh, our president, our uh, premier and various other important people uh, now <laughs> recognize that the most important thing here uh, is about public participation and the idea of open innovation. And open innovation is a idea that uh, perhaps you are well acquainted now, but this is actually relatively new in Taiwan. Uh, it only uh, became a national agenda, I think, around late 2014. Before, um, the government always see itself, uh, or usually sees itself, as, as this thing, right? Uh, as, as a kind of arbiter um, between different social interests. It could be the left and the right, right? It could be uh, the environmental uh, protection groups and development groups. It could be between the pan green and pan blue uh, camps here, and, and so on, right? So, but the, because the government keeps seeing itself as kind of an arbiter uh, to keep people organized and to kind of settle on a fair uh, treatment, and the, so the government imagines itself as a driver uh, to many things like the back in the millennium development goal days. Uh, but, but this is, frankly speaking, outdated. Because uh, if, um, like pe for people who grow up m with mobile phones, this is self-evident, so I would not belabor the point. But uh, people don't need government to organize them to themselves. Um, if you have a right hashtag, it could be Me Too, it could be Ice Bucket Challenge, it could be whatever. People just organize them on themselves. They, they don't really need a representative from the parliament or from the government to uh, organize them. And then people are very innovative. So, so the, the various different groups, the power of each group and the uh, uh, sheer number of each group are, frankly speaking, beyond what the government can sensibly uh, arbitrate between. And so we're, we're now asking a different set of questions with the social innovation plan and the uh, so-called open government initiative starting late 2014. Instead of asking what is um, you know, the fair redistribution and how to organize people, we recognize people are organizing themselves. And so we ask instead, uh, so we, we have different positions. Uh, and then we ask what, what are our common values? So if people have common values amidst different positions, then we just make sure that those values are well deliberated, that are spread uh, to everywhere in Taiwan. And then based on those values, we ask who can come up with solutions that based on these values works for everyone. And so that's two very different set of questions. What are common values and what uh, solutions works for everyone? And 
the people in the co-op sector, uh, like the homemakers union, people in the MPO sector, like the children are us, and social enterprises taking the company form, uh, like Li Ren, has been working on this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder model for the past 20 or so years. And so in Taiwan, what we're now doing is that we're learning from these people and then uh, work basically redefining our work as cross-sectoral um, international partnership toward those kind of goals. And so uh, in many uh, social innovation uh, events uh, here in Taiwan, you will now begin to see various uh, SDG marks uh, addressing which part of the SDG that it's working on. We, of course, have our voluntary national report, uh, but we're now also working on a public consultation to set our uh, national goals, and that Again, is also done in the public consultation platform, the join uh, platform, J-O-I-N.G-O-V.T-O-W, which is our main uh, platform for e-petition, for regulatory uh, consultation, as well as for, I think this is relatively new, uh, for uh, budget tracking, so that people can see not just what their ideas are being taken care of by the government, but also uh, what upcoming uh, regulations are, and also how the government is spending the taxpayers' money, and toward which goals, and how to track how they um, you know, establish those um, projects and how those projects are um, become procurements or other spending or research items and everything has this uh, open discussion area where people can ask directly what, what's going on and uh, have a direct line of contact uh, with for example this is social housing um, of how, how the things are going and have a real discussion with the people in charge of this and I think in this Taiwan is pretty advanced because uh, um, President Tsai has, in her presidential campaign, this idea of internet or broadband as human right. So we can safely assume that most people, if they don't have access to broadband, it's always the government's fault. And so we have a special budget that makes sure that everybody who wants broadband access has broadband access. And so a lot of uh, this basic information, we can just post it online and rely on the communities and social enterprise locally to surface their SDG-related ideas into this public platform and then for us to respond very very quickly, uh, literally every every week actually, um, we have this social innovation lab here in Taipei. Uh, and the idea, and, and this is um, drawn by many of the visual work is done by people with Down syndrome. Uh, that is Xi Hanger, what, what we call Xi Hanger here. Um, and they turn out to be very good artists and this is uh, collectively decorated in a way that combines all those different forces. And uh, this space is special in that the, the policy, the rules for using the space are crowdsourced. So people say at that time, over 100 uh, social innovators say this has to open until 11 p.m. So it opens until 11 p.m. It has to have a kitchen, it has to have a cafe, it, has, it needs a resident chef, so we have a resident chef. And they say that the ministry has to be here every Wednesday, so I'm, I'm here actually every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then uh, even for local social innovators, as I said, uh, when they're surfacing some local community and issues, uh, for for example, this is in Hualien. Uh, then we used video conference to get even more rural places like Taidong uh, into the discussion. And then in Taipei, in the Social Innovation Lab, more than 12 different ministries related to social innovation, they're here also in a remote kind of way to look at the uh, uh, issues that's brought to the table. And I, I always tour around Taiwan and chair this kind of consultation meetings. But the people here in Taipei, they just contribute through this teleconference in real time. And so this is basically because Taiwan geography, we can actually do this problem as human rights, so we just go to indigenous areas, to rural areas, and make sure that everything everybody says safely in their own uh, community is surfaced into this national uh, e-petition and uh, e-consultation platform uh, for the uh, work of the SDGs that's um, across all the different ministries. So that's our basic idea, in, in that instead of telling the different communities and volunteer groups what to do, we just make sure that we meet them frequently enough so that we can surface what they're doing um, nationwide as well as worldwide and make sure that uh, there's full visibility of what everybody's doing and making sure that it, they collectively form the social innovation that is needed to address the common values that people identify through this kind of consultation meeting. So this is like a very high level overview, but that's the the basic idea. Um, and so after answering this question, I would like to take my jacket off. <laughs>
pretty hard here, and you, you've already stored SDGP in anyway, so it fulfilled its purpose, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, how is Taiwan perceived on international media, and how can we improve and maintain per perceptions? Um, well, this is a, a very deep question. Um, I personally, I, I advocate this idea of uh, warm power. There is a Facebook group just called Taiwan Warm Power that is maintained, I think, by quite a few young anonymous uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, public servants. Uh, but but the, the basic idea is to propose this idea of Taiwan's common value, uh, that is democracy and freedom, and because our generation, like I'm 37 now, I know pretty old, but people who are older than me, they, we all remember the martial law uh, era. While people younger than us, they don't remember the martial law era anymore. As long as the people around here still remember the martial law era, um, the absolute freedom of speech, absolute freedom of assembly, and so on, those are core values. So while in older democratic or older republic, uh, those are seen sometimes as instrumental values, like they, they've been having it for a while. But in Taiwan, this is actually pretty new, and it coincides uh, with the advent of the internet, um, the popularization of internet around 1994, uh, 95, uh, coincides with the first presidential election in 1996. And so, in many um, people's mind, uh, internet and democracy in Taiwan, they're, they're not two things; they're one and the same thing. And so, in in our generation. We basically see, um, let's see, let's see, right. So basically, what we're what we're thinking, um, like back when we occupied the parliament for twenty two days, uh, it is that internet and democracy. These are not two kinds of people. It is not like people who work in tech, work in internet culture, in new media or whatever, and people work in, you know, um, governance uh, in. Uh, you know, uh, what, what we just said about uh, democracy and consultation and things like that. In older republics and older democracies, those t tends to be two different kinds of people. But because of the fact that Taiwan just became uh, a place where you can practice democracy uh, for only 30 years, actually, in its full form, um, the people who work on democracy and people who work on internet and new media and things like that, they're actually the same kind of people. And so when we see a large-scale uh, crowdsourced um, demonstration like this, we see people from all the different fields together and um, sharing the value of democracy and we don't see the political apathy or democratic apathy in other countries where very much a, a newly reborn democracy that's still very much focused on the possibilities of how technology and the various different disciplines can contribute to democracy. And so when I said this is a demonstration, I don't mean that it is a protest. It is pretty thoroughly non-violent. It is a demonstration in the sense that it is a demo. It is It demos how we can use um, ICT and other related technologies and consultation methods to collectively organize, mobilize more than half a million people on the street and many more online, so that over the course of 22 days, when people want to talk about every single aspect of the CSSTA, the cross Strait uh, Service and Trade Agreement, people can actually go into it very deeply and emerge with a consensus that that's more convergent every day. And this uh, runs counter, actually, in, in to many <laughs> expectations of uh, democracy, right? When we run consultations like this, uh, using either face-to-face -face or internet or public hearing or whatever, people expect that people to uh, be, be divisive, to be polarized, and given the recent uh, elections in major countries, uh, maybe <laughs> get people to uh, be move uh, more apart from each other. But the demonstration was about if you design the space just right, if you make sure that everybody is fully heard in a safe space without the um, um, possibility of disrupting the process itself, then actually over the course of a month or so, people actually converge on consensus statements. People spend more time agreeing with each other and finding the common values that they have, rather than uh, being more apart. Of course, that requires the careful design of the online offline spaces and rules concerning those. But I would like the international community to see Taiwan as uh, somewhere that innovates upon this kind of uh, collective decision-making process. And so this is my main work, and it coincides with SDG 17, which is about using open data and accountability and consultation methods to make sure that people can find the common values together. And so this is an angle, I think, not um, 
Like, it, it's not like compared to food or, or, or tourism. It is not uh, at the moment uh, the most uh, prominent idea people have about Taiwan. But in fact, we've been doing this kind of uh, open government and democracy innovations for quite some time. And people, I think, after the uh, Constitutional Court's uh, ruling of the marriage equality as well as the new referendum act uh, later this year. There's more international um, coverage about this new um, democratic process that Taiwan is going through, especially uh, it's very different and unique among our Asian <laughs> counterparts and because um, there's frankly speaking many people who think that democracy uh, and progress seem to be intentioned by in Taiwan to reinforcing each other. So that is, I think, one of the key messages we want to give out to, to the media and also that Taiwan knows how is it like to be a dictatorship and then becoming a democracy under threats from dictatorships. And then uh, we can give out this kind of experiences and um, modernization and democratization uh, help to the other countries and other regions nearby and the other people nearby. As Digital Minister, how do you see technology developing and fitting into the culture? Um, I have a poem for that, so I will <laughs> read a poem for you. <laughs> okay, and, and then we'll expand a little bit on the poem. Um, so the poem is really a prayer. It is a prayer that I wrote when I was visiting New Zealand um, uh, a year and a half ago, and when I was just appointed Digital Minister. It goes like this. Um, when we see um, Internet of Things, Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we hear that a singularity is near, let's remember that a plurality is here. So the, the prayer, it's, I hope, pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> but, but the idea, very simply put, is that technology serves the society, not the other way around. Um, the society, long as that we recognize there is a plurality of people, of, of different ideas, of different thoughts, of different habits, if the, this diversity and inclusive um, empathy is introduced through technology, then the technology helps the society to recognize itself and become more aware of itself. If instead that technology comes and uh, just shares this idea that only one part of people get to benefit from the technology, the technologists usually and the capitalists, but, uh, then it, it has the potential of dividing the society apart and basically having uh, people separating itself into the haves and the have-nots when a new technology arrives. So as a digital minister in charge of uh, digital related policies, um, Taiwan does something that is quite um, unique really among um, Asian countries. For example, when the machine learning, uh, this generation of artificial intelligence arrives, the first thing that we think about is how we can make a um, AI computing cluster that is accessible free of charge to students of all different levels, no matter where they are in Taiwan. If they don't have a tablet at home, if they don't have access to the right um, curriculum and things like that, we work with multinationals, but also with, with uh, large civil society organizations like Mozilla to make sure that um, not only Mandarin-speaking people and English-speaking people in Taiwan have access to machine learning tools, but also equivalently um, Hakka-speaking people, uh, Holo-speaking people, and various different indigenous uh, languages and nations. And so um, the idea is that when the technology arrives, it has every potential to shape the society so that people who conform to some mainstream values or mainstream languages or mainstream places of access um, have the most, most benefit it. But we can start by saying there is this different society, there's different indigenous nations, they have different relationships um, in their society and also with the environment. How can we use machine learning and other various technologies to help further their 
um, identity and further their uniqueness instead of asking them to conform to some Han ethnic um, way of uh, relating to technology. And I think this uh, emphasis on diversity and on uh, reinforcing the solidarity between existing group, social groups instead of tearing them apart, I think is really unique here um, in Taiwan. And um, one of the examples I, I like to um, talk about is that um, like in many other places, we're now also considering uh, rolling out autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles. But while in many cases, in many states in the US, for example, uh, they start with the, the one that has the most economic advantage, long-haul trucks or like very fast uh, vans and things like that. Uh, well, what we start to do here, actually, in partnership with uh, the MIT Media Lab in the Social Innovation Center, is this tricycle, right? They call itself the uh, persuasive electric vehicle or PEVs and this is a demonstration of AI times collective intelligence the idea very simply put is that these open source uh, very slow tricycles they're here in Taipei City and they just roam the road using the same right of road as pedestrians and because they're sl sl slow enough uh, if they run into building or people no, no harm is being done really uh, and they basically experiment on how the city receives this new species so it's like how dogs co-domesticate with human beings and then uh, it let us establish new norms of how people want to interact with this kind of new uh, tricycles and also engage elder people and people who are tourists in Taiwan because all they want is go to Jingbo Flower Market and get some, you know, uh, some pots of <laughs> flowers and, and something like that, put it into the basket and sit on it and just drive it home and maybe with the fleet of two more uh, tricycles carrying more and more uh, luggage and things like that. So it solves the social need, but it is a social need that is not driven in a top-down fashion, but it's actually surfacing the actual social need by the community. And so using this kind of safe and participatory design, what we're trying to do is that we not only let the AI understand the human society more, but we also let the human society understand how the AI is looking at the, the street and things like that. So it's just a very small example, but it illustrates the idea of the sandbox that, like children playing in the sandbox, we, we want to get the confidence and the trust and solidarity between the technologists and the people who are going to benefit from the technology instead of having one technology like just dominating the social discourse and the society. So how is it like working as the digital minister? What is your day like? Thanks for asking. Uh, it depends on which day of the week it is. So when I become the digital minister a year and a half ago, there's three preconditions uh, that I set um, as kind of uh, ground rules of the cabinet uh, working with me. I, I often say that I work with Taiwan, I'm not working for Taiwan, uh, because I'm an anarchist, I'm a conservative anarchist. My ideal political system is one which that there is no hierarchical control and there's no commanding relationship between people. Of course, I may not see it in my lifetime, <laughs> right? Yes, the environment would like to add that the straws are bad for the environment. That is an excellent observation. We are working on it, actually. Um, do you know that um, if the uh, plastic straws, um, people are looking at alternative, it turns out that if uh, just, you know, those spaghetti noodles, that what the one that with a hole in it, you can use it for up for four hours as a straw without it actually getting, um, right? So, so now you know it is actually a, a very uh, innovative uh, straw alternative that we're exploring. But in any case, yes, so <laughs> working as a digital minister, um, I have three preconditions. The, the first one, as I said, is that I, I never issue a single command. Uh, the people who work with me, they're my peers. Uh, they um, score themselves. I, I don't handle their scoring and I don't issue KPIs. There's about 20, 21 full-timers and about 30, 40 uh, interns uh, in my office, but they, they all decide what they want to do. And uh, it is very important that I don't stay up to too, too, too late. I usually just leave the administration building around 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. and so that people don't feel the pressure of having to work until 9 p.m. Um, right, as our new colleague here would attest, right, it's a very different from uh, her day uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right, so um, in any case, 
case, that's the first thing, is that I don't take command and I don't give command. I work by voluntary association, that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, I don't have to work in a single building. So every Monday I do work in administration because that is the minister uh, level meeting with the premier. But every Tuesday I usually just tour around Taiwan to rural places, to indigenous places, as you just saw here. Every Wednesday I'm usually, well, like giving talks like this, but also <laughs> in the uh, social innovation lab is my office hour. So um, literally you can book my time online. It's au.pdis.tw. And then people will just bring whatever they, they want to talk about um, and, and book until August, I see, right? <laughs> but 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 you can also walk in um, in the in the early morning, uh, which is like the walking time. So it's just like a I don't know a therapist or something. <laughs> so <laughs> we we have the hours reserved, and we have the hours that uh, meeting just random strangers who happen to walk by. And every uh, Wednesday Wednesday night, we also have dinner together and with the lo local civic um, technology group uh, called Gov Zero G Zero V. Um, anyway, that's Wednesday, and so Thursday, it's again the cabinet meeting itself. It's not just the premier, but all the different cabinet members and the science and technology policy meeting, so which usually takes place in the um, science and technology building. And so Friday is usually reserved for collaboration meetings. The collaboration meetings um, are shaped, I think, very interestingly, just a lot of person notes. Um, so, for example, um, last May, uh, we in our e-petition platform, there's this designer that proposed this, um, I don't think it's a radically new idea, but it's pretty um, negative uh, emotion, uh, basically, uh, that our text filing software is explosively hostile to users. I think that's the right translation. And in any case, what, what he really meant was that it's very difficult to use on Mac and on Linux because uh, the Windows version is different from the Mac and Linux version. And the Mac and Linux version really was pretty bad uh, last year around. And instead of just you know looking at all those 200 people on our e-petition platform, each offering um, you know what we call like Fei Chang Suan, so exedic uh, uh, commentary. We just uh, have the participation officer, which is a group of people in every single ministry, uh, just like media officer working with the traditional media and uh, parliamentary officer working with the MPs, the uh, participation officers or POs, they work with stakeholders that are just emerging using hashtags or using other online platforms and engage them directly. So our PO from the Ministry of Finance just issued uh, an invitation within the first, I think, 36 hours saying, whomever complain about the text file system automatically get an invitation ticket to our collaboration meeting uh, the, the coming Friday. And we just use post-it notes, design thinking, and you know service design methodologies to make sure that everybody understand what is really wrong uh, with our text filing experience. And magically, it just turns it around. It used to be that 80% of people was just complaining about government. But after the invitation is sent, 80% of people offers constructive criticism. I think the key here uh, with collaboration meeting in Friday is just we take people's suggestions as is. If they said Zibao like words are explosively um, plenty, right? The, the vo volume of words are just explosive. Or right? So <laughs> the splendor confuses people or whatever, right? Um, they, we, we just keep it as is. We, we don't harmonize uh, their, their input. Instead, we just collectively identify what needs to, to be done, and then we work with the civil servants and uh, IT company representatives with professional facilitation and collectively redesign the tax finance system together. So this is my Friday. It's usually um, on collaboration meetings. So that's my that's my weekdays. So every day is dedicated to a different theme, and uh, I don't have to work inside one particular administration building. Conversely, my interns are also over the place. We have an intern in New York now, and the whole two months she doesn't even have to visit Taiwan. So uh, if you want to be our intern, <laughs> you, you can you know spread the news. Uh, we every year we recruit interns to look at all the different services, um, digital services that government offers. So like. Last year, we look at all the tablet uh, experiences, and this year, we are looking at all the mobile experiences of every single um, website uh, that is offered by the government. 
And um, basically what, what we did is that we make sure that everybody who knows some, they don't have to know programming, they just need to know how to use a phone. Uh, and then they, they can just look at all the 500 plus uh, websites and uh, check whether it's friendly or not. And if it's not friendly, then all, all the interns have to do is to take screenshots. And then one third of the interns just look at the screenshots and offer their expertise in JavaScript or in CSS or in what it, whatever web technologies. And then so instead of you know just offering complaints, they offer gifts uh, to the various ministries. Like if you just change those three lines, everybody will be so much better. So, so that is the basic idea. We connect the youth uh, with the ministries as equals, as partners. They're, they're not uh, like doing only the things that the ministry is asking them to do. They exploratorily uh, find what's wrong and what could be better with the services and work with the peers to suggest things that could have worked better. And then it's just incorporated into the ministry's uh, services and websites. So that is our main idea. The idea is that to um, just offer what's going on, what's really going on with the government for everybody to see and for people who have any idea for improvement, invite people who complain the loudest uh, to the um, in consultation meetings. So that's my second um, like precondition, right? So uh, I work anywhere and work with the people instead of for the people. And the third thing, um, beyond not issuing or taking command and working everywhere, working with the people, is this, I think I'm the only minister level person in the world doing this now, is the idea of radical transparency. So basically all the uh, public talk that I give, uh, for example, is now being live streamed, but it, it's, it could be recorded and then published afterwards under a creative common license. But even internal meetings that I chair, I also publish a full record uh, for everybody to see. And this takes actually enormous um, courage <laughs> for, uh, for especially career public servants to uh, understand that everything that they say, um, even if it's just at a drafting stage, even if it's only at the idea stage, uh, is published for the entire world to see. And the reason why we're doing this, and we're not doing it violently, it's not like we're, we're doing it in a live stream fashion. We take a full um, text record of the audit meetings that I chair, and I send this collect collectively editable document for everybody, and they have 10 working days, that's two weeks, to edit away all the non-professional or non-civilized parts that they uttered. And so it's not just people who listen to one another more deeply, afterwards uh, by editing this meeting record together, but I also get many useful suggestions just by people who look at those transcripts and then have a much better idea of what the government is thinking. And surprisingly, after a year or so running with this radical transparency, uh, the feedback I get from the career public servant is that it actually makes them more innovative and more risk-taking rather than more risk-averse and conservative. And the reason why is that they can always blame me if things go wrong <laughs> because I'm the only person doing this radical transparency stuff. So, so if, if things go wrong, it's always my fault. And, but if things go right, they get a full credit because for career public servants, many of their, their um, ideas are pretty good, but the ministers, if things go right, the minister usually take the, the credit and if things go wrong or the things don't fit the minister's idea, then the society doesn't even know that a career public servant has such uh, innovations in the first place. But by publicing, publishing everything uh, to the public, uh, people see that the career public servants are actually full of innovative ideas and if things go wrong, I can absorb the blame. So we actually get a lot of more risk-taking behavior from the career public service based on my third uh, precondition of working. Um, government collection and usage of data has become a hot topic in the USA. Oh, it's about time. As digital minister, <laughs> what direction would, would I take Taiwan in how it uses big data? Right, so um, we have this um, slide that talks about this. Yeah. So um, the, the number of one um, doctrine we have is about data agency, right? So we see data not as um, an asset to be bought and sold and 
borrowed, right? Because it's not a physical asset. It, 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 the metaphor just doesn't work this way. So, so we don't see it as an asset. We see it as a relation. If you store your data, for example, in the Medicare database, or on your card, or on a, in the future, um, your, your own device, or whatever, all, all this uh, represents trust. All this represents a continuing relationship between you and the data being collected, data being processed, and the data being used. And the idea of data agency is that the citizen has the full right to know of what really is happening uh, with their data when it's being processed and being used in a way that is proportional to their expectation of their trust to the people. So like in today's um, consultation meeting, collaboration meeting about the Medicare card, um, there's many people who say um, that they trust their phone and their fingerprint store in their phone's secure uh, enclave more than the cloud. So that's something that we gotta respect. There's more people who say, you know, uh, it's very useful to be able to update the photo because on the physical car maybe it's 10 years old photo, but then they prefer that the photo is stored locally on their phone instead of on a uh, database that could be used in uh, some other use like, uh, I don't know, face identification among the crowd or things like that. So they want to, uh, to, eat, to be accountable to the government to be accountable for its use and that accountability is a relationship again it entails what we here translate as when so people can ask about the account of how their data is being used it also translates as dance like the government agencies who stores the data should voluntarily and proactively let the citizens know how the data, data is being used and maintained and being kept up to date and the mechanism itself is also what we call kuzu which means that it keeps an automatic log of how the data is being used who is being who is accessing what and things like that in a way that is uh, conformant to the privacy laws and so so this uh, pipeline of collection, processing, and use uh, should be in line of this data agency principle. And so we do see that people who want to use the private data for more tailor-made and customized service, but this is very different from this public um, collaboration based on open data and the two uh, spheres, they don't overlap. And so the idea is that if you have a bunch of private data, the only way to use it in a statistics kind of way as open data is just to work with the cutting edge statistics research community and to make sure that it really is statistics and not just you know, de-identified potentially pseudonymous data that could be re-identified in the future. So working with cutting edge statistics um, methodologies is also one of our key goals in establishing our national data protection uh, authority, which will be under the um, National Development Council, the Guofahui. I think it's uh, slated to be open about uh, nine days from now. And so that is a, a new thing. The DPA within the NDC will uh, charter out this uh, course of reconciling the people who want to use statistics for public good and the people uh, wish to retain their data agency. And in the end, I don't think those two are in opposition to each other. If people have a better relationship with the data, then the data processes have the most up-to-date data that reflects people's will, and then you will not just have a shadow, outdated profile of a person five years ago and using it uh, toward, you know, biased uh, policy making and things like that. We prefer, um, you know, voluntary relationships. So that is the direction that we're taking in Taiwan's data governance. Um, how do traditional Taiwanese values uh, interact and conflict with technology? Wow, well, um, how do I begin, right? So <laughs> there's traditional Taiwanese values uh, 4,000 years ago, right? The, the Austronesian people who learned, um, you know, wayfinding and uh, sailed, at least culturally, we were told, to Madagascar and to New Zealand. Um, and that is the out-of-Taiwan out hypothesis. I, I, I happen to think that this indigenous um, like Disney promoted uh, idea of uh, seafaring, it is particularly in alignment with internet-based technologies who connects people and cultures without having to physically co-inhabit the, the same place. So for me, if you talk about traditional Taiwanese values, I would always think of the, the Atayal uh, people which you are going to visit tomorrow and told, and the uh, people and various other nations that 
um, connects us to various people now. So, um, so I visited New Zealand three times uh, during my work in digital minister to various different cities, and it is very important to me personally that in our trade agreement, the ANSTEC, that it's not just economic and cultural agreement, but there's a parallel track of diplomacy between our indigenous people and the Maori people there. And I think it reflects the idea that it is not us um, you know, dominating the discourse about the relationship between technology and society and environment, but it could be seen from a Maori oriented way that takes care of some, you know, they don't need SDGs, that's, that's their native culture, they don't need to be reminded to be mindful of the environment, things like we need to be reminded. So I think it's very important and it's also fortunate that we have a um, president that is partly indigenous in heritage and also uh, in culture that can just help us um, navigate the, these traditional values uh, with technology. Um, but of course there's also traditional other uh, values as well and I think um, the, the main um, interaction that we're seeing, at least in public consultation meetings that I personally run, is this idea of plurality. In Taiwan people really do respect each other's variety a lot and when we, for example, when first, uh, when when Uber came to, to Taiwan and started engaging drivers without professional driver's license, when we asked people, what do you feel about that? Uh, we used this online system called Polis, where you can use your Facebook or Twitter or remain anonymous and sign in and see all your friends uh, in various different uh, factions uh, thinking very differently about the UberX thing by just agreeing or disagreeing on each other's reflections. But what we're reflecting here is something that is uh, could have a common value. So people very quickly converge on common value. And this is what we're seeing here in Taiwan, is that despite the differences in upbringing, in personal experiences, when you set up pro the spaces so that people can compete on how much social resonance and empathy people can show, it is a very positive competition that people would, would like to participate and, and actually actively competes by um, you know, proposing more ideas that could attract more people across the aisle. So I think this idea of um, common values among um, the different um, ideologies, this kind of plurality, I think that is the, the main thing that um, makes the open government work in Taiwan very easy to do. Um, but of course there's also more traditional values that is about hierarchical, um, you know, commanding relations, a, a not peer-to-peer, -peer, but rather seniority-driven or, um, you know, um, what we would call technocracy, like uh, expert-driven uh, conversation and things like that. And when we're now moving toward a innovation model that values the social needs and the people's actual personal experience, those become the things that we need to do away with, or at least temporarily set in to brackets, that is to say, uh, regardless of whether someone's title is minister or whatever, everybody should be given the same peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, chance of having setting the agenda and instead of you know just a commanding behavior because using commanding behavior is very different uh, from what people's actual daily experience and if I set up my office hours so that everybody have to travel from remote island from rural places all the way to Taipei just to have 30 minutes of presentation then I will not relate to those people that much so instead of why I just uh, walk to the different communities and try to just live there for, for a couple of days and things like that and to make sure that uh, every Everybody's uh, worldview is given equal airtime using, of course, technologies like live streaming and other um, digital conservation technologies. So there's some conflict, I think, with the existing narratives of dominance and of hierarchy and of seniority. But I think uh, the newer generation is now much more tolerant and much more diverse and um, much more willing to engage in a now traditional way. What is the most exciting project that I'm overseeing at this time? Um, there's plenty, um, but let me see if there's something that I can share within five minutes or so. Um, so there's this project um, called the, it, it's called Airbox, A-I-R-B-O-X. 
Um, it is a project born out of Taiwan civil society. And the main uh, visualization platform is called Jilin Li Yilin Shi Kong Wu Guan Se Wang. It, it may be useful to introduce the, the main idea of G0V. The G0V was a um, movement that's still going pretty strong after almost 16 years now, that basically looks at all the government websites and services and uh, find the ones that don't work well or find the ones that just doesn't, isn't interactive enough. And so, for example, the uh, legislative is uh, right? So you will find um, this maybe not to your liking, and then people will set up an alternate website, a shadow website, just called ly.g0v.tw. And so all, all it takes is on a government website, you just change an O to a zero, and you get into the shadow government. You don't have to Google for it. And then it shows what a civil society's reimagination of the service or the website is about. So for example, the budget visualization was the first Gov0 project, and we see hundreds of uh, Gov0 projects um, that re resulted in the various different reimaginations of how the government can do. And it's really a meme, it's a virus of the mind that spreads. So when I give a talk to New Zealand, g0v.nz gets registered, and there's gov0.network.us, um, .it, .whatever, um, and, and it's all those various different people reimagining their local government or their regional government services. So this particular one is about the environmental agency, the EPA here in Taiwan. While the EPA does offer some measurement of air pollution, uh, the air pollution measurement sites are sometimes away uh, from the people or in the higher up places or in, and in any case, if it's not in somebody's balcony or school, people don't feel it's close enough, right? So there's, there's a bunch of people just buying those small, cheap PM 2.5 and other air quality sensors and making sure that, you know, they sometimes they wear it, but mostly they uh, install it in their, their home and in their schools. And there's some cities like the Taipei City using it as a primary school uh, teaching um, method. And more than 2,000 um, nodes are set up around Taiwan, and in real time, they just um, um, monitor the trends of human behavior and the environmental, um, you know, meteorological data and various other uh, data, and correlates it uh, automatically with the um, air quality around Taiwan. And all of this is citizen science; it's not government funded in any way. And I think this is important um, in our line of work because it is very rare, especially around East Asia, that the government will let something like this happen. Um, our East Asian counterparts often tells me that either if there's a lack of political will and technical know-how in the civil society, but more often um, when people organize to like 200 different uh, sites, not 2,000, maybe just 20, um, maybe they will just get um, a call from the local authority and saying maybe you know, don't spread rumors or don't spread uh, you know, imprecise information or things like that because it does threaten the legitimacy of the government if you participate into one of this even though the measurement quality is less that of the EPA just because it's closer to you of course you will uh, believe this numbers more right so but in Taiwan uh, basically we don't fight the civil society we, we support the civil society um, this is our slogan so <laughs> So if we can't win at legitimacy, we just join <laughs> in their legitimacy. So uh, one of the most exciting projects I'm working on is so-called IoT for Public Good, or where we just various different communities. It's not just air, it's, it's meteorological, it's earthquake-related uh, plate, uh, plate uh, you know, prediction-ish data. Uh, it's also disaster and recovery data. It's various different sources. Any data that is environmental in nature and not concerning privacy is fair game. And in the IoT for Public Good, we focus on having the E tree, uh, Yuan, to help manufacturing more precise, domestic, but still very cheap um, equipment for these people. And also, we offer free supercomputing hosting uh, to these people's numbers. And it's very important because we we also work with the civil society people working with uh, distributed ledger technology, uh, so-called blockchain people. But I don't 
usually use that term because the newest uh, distributed ledgers are not even a chain anymore. But in any case, uh, the distributed ledger people like IOTA, um, they also store these numbers so they get another level of accountability so that people won't, like when election comes, they retroactively modify the data. That would be very bad. So this immutable ledger, <laughs> I think it's also very important in keeping everybody honest. And so the main thing is that we just aggregate everything into the National uh, Center for High Performance Computation, and then we award those grants to people and solicit um, machine learning algorithms and whatever from everywhere so that people can compute on the same data and collectively build a more accurate picture of how the air is like uh, in Taiwan. And what, what, what surprises me and makes me very happy is that uh, before we even uh, have this allocate this money um, to the IoT for Public Good, um, there's various people around the world already because it's open source, it's open innovation, already setting up their own local chapters of monitoring uh, devices and now just reporting their numbers in a purely voluntary fashion. And so I think just through this uh, IoT for Public Good and related programs, we're actively doing what uh, the government should do is just a fair ground of accountability and making sure everybody can cheaply access the public data that is uh, for the public good. And I think that is one of the things that I'm most excited. Um, if you asked this question a few months ago, I would say that the most exciting thing I'm working on is called the Presidential Hackathon. But the Presidential Hackathon is over now. <laughs> we have to wait till, till next year. Uh, but this year, again, we have um, more than 100 teams, and it is again private sector, civil society working on the various presidential promises, and we select five teams. And again, in, in line of this idea of social impact, that there's no prize money whatsoever. They get this, the, the top five teams get this wonderful trophy that is doubles as a projector that projects their uh, their work and their photo with the president and things like that. But uh, the, the main prize is for the top five team to be incorporated back into the public service. So they will get the political will, their regulatory support, whatever they're working on, they will be part of public service within the, the next year. And there's a few teams like Taiwan Co Water Corporation who worked uh, called Qiangjiu Shui Bao Bao. I think the English name is, is um, Water Saviors, right? So the Water Saviors team using artificial intelligence to learn the wisdom of um, old professional uh, people who are employed to hear the leakage in the mains. And uh, even though they employ like more than 60 those old professionals, after um, you know, if they just tour around Taiwan and listen to all the, all, all the mains, all the pipes, it takes three years for them to finish a tour. So a new leaking point may take like two or three years before it gets discovered. And of course, it's not a very good use of resources, and especially that water shortage after climate change is uh, a concern for everybody now. So what they're now doing is just asking, they have a lot of data, but they ask the machine learning people uh, from everywhere in the world, really, to participate in this uh, machine learning project that learns from the professional wisdom. And they did uh, succeed, I think, toward 80% or so uh, accuracy to predict where the leakage will happen when it's next visited. So they concentrate um, their visitation time and reduce, I think, up to 90% uh, of the waste of people's time in uh, addressing leakage. So I think this is very surprising and useful. Uh, so a moose asked what would be the slogan. I think it's a follow-up question that summarizes the more than 20 minutes <laughs> that I just spent uh, describing my work. Sure. Um, I, I think um, my, my main work, um, as I used in the title of this talk, um, is called Forking Democracy. And this is a very geeky term. Fork is a computer science term. It, it, it basically says, if you see something that has a tradition that goes like this, sometimes you don't want it to go to the same direction. Sometimes you want to fork, like take it into a different direction. But this is not um, refusing. This is not taking away. This is certainly not bomb-throwing anarchist. This is basically saying <laughs> we respect the tradition as it is, but we would like to innovate on a different angle, like using machine learning uh, 
in addition to prof professionals to address water li leakage or to have the local indigenous wisdom in addition to the Han ethnic way to discover um, how to do machine translation and other speech recognition and stuff. So having this room for people to innovate, to fork the government and the democracy and work out a, a new way. And most of the time they fail, but we celebrate failure by encouraging people to share postmortems. So many of these don't like don't go anywhere. They they go nowhere. But sometimes um, that there is a valid way. And then my main work is just to work as kind of a facilitating person to provide a space to convince the public service here that they really can leave away their fear and uncertainty and doubt uh, and don't have the, to just part with this not invented here syndrome and allow the civil society and the private sector to collaboratively determine what we're going to do uh, to further the sustainable development goals and to further our democracy. So this idea of forking and merging democracy, I think that's my main uh, working method. And this is really the only method if you're a minister who never issue or take command. You can only work with suggestions. So, so basically the idea is to make sure that everybody know what is, this part is about is radical transparency by providing space and sufficient data information for social innovation and by making sure that the participation officers in every ministry is ready to incorporate better ideas, to, to not think about it as losing face, as may means, but rather welcome the civic uh, innovations. I think that is the TLDR of my work, is just forking and merging democracy. And if you want an even shorter version, I will defer to President Tsai, uh, who said in her inauguration speech, like before, uh, democracy in Taiwan means a competition, a conflict between two different sides of a value. But from now on, uh, she would like to invite everybody to reimagine democracy as a conversation between a diversity of values. So from conflict to conversation uh, among diverse values, I think that is the most TLDR uh, that, um, that we can offer. And thanks to uh, President Tsai's inauguration speech uh, for, for this kind of uh, idea. So it is not my legacy. Uh, I'm mostly just a facilitating person, a space for this kind of uh, innovation to happen and leave their own legacy. I don't really care about my legacy. Um, so um, most of us are entering or in college. What would be the best piece of advice you can give based on your experiences or perhaps the best advice I've received? Um, I'm going to be very biased because I've never been uh, enrolled in a college. I've never been to senior high. I'm a junior high school dropout. Uh, I started my first art uh, when I was 15 years old, when I was second year in my junior high, and I just dropped out of junior high afterwards. So um, asking college advice from me, it is <laughs> kind of, um, maybe I can offer an outsider's view, because um, after I drop out from junior high, I always view the university and college as resources. Whenever I want to embark on a new project, I drop out not because I can't fit in with the uh, junior high people or, or that I don't want to edu be educated, but rather because when I was um, second year in junior high, I encountered this world web and um, there's a lot of preprints like ArcSieve. Uh, it's already around in some form around that time. And for the uh, so social uh, studies people here, there's also social arc ArcSieve now. In every different field, there's this preprint community of academics and researchers just publishing their work in progress without the full journalistic you know, uh, review process. And so just by engaging those authors and writing their email, and they no, they don't know that I'm 15 years old. Uh, they just treat me as a you know um, collaborator, and then we work on many interesting cutting edge projects. And at that time, I discovered that this like 10 years in advance from what the textbook says, because it usually takes 10 years for the cutting edge idea to become mainstream, to become curriculum, to become textbooks, right? So, so it's like I'm fast forwarding 10 years into the future. And once I taste the future, I don't want to be uh, in the past anymore. So which is why I convinced my um, junior high school people to let me drop out. And so um, I think this eventually informed Taiwan's uh, regulations so that we are uh, Asian, I think 
definitely the most advanced in Asia, but one of the most advanced in the world in, in terms of experimental education. So in Taiwan, up to 10% of students can be experimentally uh, taught. It could be homeschooling, it could be alternative school systems, it could be group schooling, it could be using those different colleges as resources and, and just have their own curriculum, basically, uh, as long as it's approved by the committee in their city, they are allowed to self-educate or group educate from the basic education all the way to college now. So uh, we have a lot of experimental education methods that then we take the best parts and into the basic education that's going to be rolled out next year. And so my advice um, to both people in alternative education and people in the normal <laughs> education is it, it, simply this, it is to think in a way that's anti-disciplinary. Because I, I'm, I'm, I firmly believe that disciplines are not in a traditional discipline kind of way, but in a uh, academic disciplines, uh, not self-discipline. That's very important. But academic disciplines, I think the fields, the idea of an academic field, I think it is actively detrimental if your main goal is to solve uh, SDG challenges, it is, if your main goal is to make the social impact. Um, it is, of course, very important to um, have real field experience and practice and things like that, but uh, if the imagination is confined within one single field, it is very much likely that the actual world will change uh, during the course of two or four years of college education, so much so that the ideas that you take for granted becomes like four years or five years out, out of date. So even for people who are currently in college, I, I always advise people to uh, learn from people who are the most different from you, either in background or in different experience, different ethnicity, different nationality, and certainly in different fields, so that you can think of the fields as something that's just arbitrary. It's like constellations in the sky. Every culture has a different uh, idea of constellation, but the, the, the stars are what's important and not how people organize them. So that's my uh, two cents. Um, how can the ROC uh, parents, Taiwanese parents, government counteract propaganda, misinformation, and fake news from hostile sources such as DPRC using new technology. Um, so, in, in, in the interest of time, I would just refer you to rumor.pdis.tw. PDIS is our office, and rumor.pdis.tw is a shorthand whenever this question arises. Um, so, um, the rumor PDIS TW uh, principle um, is very simple. The idea is that there's uh, four yes and one no, but there's some problem with the internet. Let me switch connection. It's very helpful to have more than one 4G connection sources. All right, so let's switch a little bit. Oh, here you go. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you go to rumor.pdis.tw, it has an outline of um, the roadmap of how we're dealing with this um, idea of disinformation, or actually many things that people think as intentional disinformation turn out just to be misinformation uh, that don't get corrected in time. So the most important thing here is that we're not doing we're not making a new act or we're not amending an existing act such that people's behavior online are punished differently than the face-to-face -face, um, world. So basically what we're not doing is to say that if you spread this information, uh, you, you're going to be punished uh, such and such if you do it online. But it's going to be very different if you do it uh, offline. That, that is something that we're not doing. We're not specifically doing in its own act. But the reason why we're not doing this is that we're allowing the space for the people uh, working on counteracting this information. For example, in the civil society, there is this idea, uh, this project called COFACT. Uh, in, in the COFACT um, webpage, which is not funded um, by the government in any way, uh, right, it, it, it's very, um, it's deliberately using um, the style of uh, content farms to uh, promote itself, I'm sure. Right, so, so uh, it is uh, multi, um, Model. For example, in Taiwan, we have this, uh, the most popular instant messenger is called Line. 
and line is where where we saw the most disinformation uh, spread because it's not publicly addressable. You can't find those in Google, so it has uh, the most chance to mutate and to go more viral by having one person adding more messages to it, uh, to each other's messages. So what what this is doing essentially is that if you add this bot as a line friend, and uh, it's called gender jade in Mandarin. So whenever you receive a message from your family group and you go like gender jade, is it real or not? Then you can just uh, spread it uh, and share it with the bot and the bot will help you to fact check by engaging uh, with a, a large community of fact checkers and the fact checkers basically work in a entirely transparent way you can see that they're very diligent they reply to everything now um, but if you uh, if you go re reply it then you can see what the most popular disinformation um, sometimes because it's about election time now sometimes it's election uh, based but there's a lot of about the uh, uh, World Cup uh, in soccer as well. Um, there's apparently um, the, the recurring one is always that if you eat something, it has this effect. If you eat something and something else, it has some other effect that, that never goes away. <laughs> so so you're, you're, you, you can everybody can engage in respond and we will not we will not stay in this screen for too long for the interest of mental health of everybody but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea is that uh, within hours, um, all the different fact checkers, uh, like Lean is very active now, um, is just just you know going through them one by one and and making sure that everybody who shares with this bot uh, can get this uh, third party uh, fact checking mechanism uh, that helps uh, with the, the clarification. And had we say that spreading this information online is illegal, such civil society endeavor will not happen. Right, because they will be doing criminal acts. <laughs> because they, what, what they are necessarily doing is spreading the rumors. And they're spreading the rumors in addition to the cl clarifications. And we're also the first uh, Asian country to uh, starting next year uh, add media literacy and critical thinking uh, into our basic education curriculum. It's not just a two hour class or anything like that. We require that each teacher to talk with students in a role of a co-learner in the sense that we look at the information sources from the internet together and navigate the various uh, misinformation and disinformation together so that a student instead of thinking that if the teacher say it in some way or to uh, textbook to print it in some font you automatically have to accept that everybody learns the idea of, of critical thinking I'm sure that you know in, in the US and in other European countries uh, people with you know generations of speech freedom this is taken for granted but in new democracies like in Taiwan uh, we have the opportunity of teaching media literacy in addition or in the same time with the ICT tools so instead of just you know traditional paper-based me media journalism training we're now mostly just working on automated semi-automated and ICT assisted tools so that people can learn from um, the internet but in a way that uh, encourages them to think critically and independently instead of uh, you know just blindly spreading some uh, out, like outrageous uh, news and things like that and so um, there's also one thing one extra thing that we were just doing uh, as of this month uh, is that in the executive UN's in the administration's main page um, now every ministry uh, whenever they see a disinformation that's being spread um, to the mainstream media uh, or even just very popular in the social media they now respond within one news cycle that is to say about six to twelve hours and so this is very important because first it gives the fact checker something to work from and second that it makes sure that when the newspaper is printed the next day there is a counterbalancing um, idea from the ministry in charge of course the journalists don't have to trust the government we're not a fascist country but uh, the idea is that at least two different sides, many different size voices are being uh, balanced in the report instead of you know waiting for two months or waiting for a couple of weeks before responding that would be disastrous so the main idea here is very simply to respond quickly enough so that people can learn to tell this information and information using their own critical thinking tools and for people who are stuck with um, you know uh, family channels on the line uh, messenger we at least have some civil society tools that can also communicate through such um, channels. What are your thoughts on net neutrality? Huh? Um, in Taiwan, we're going um, to 
pass the next session, uh, the Digital Communication Act, Shu uh, Wei Tong Xun Chuan Bu Fa, which has um, some clauses that protect net neutrality. But the reason why we're just talking about this now is that we, we don't really have large telecoms abusing te uh, net neutrality. So <laughs> this is a this is a kind of um, futuristic <laughs> topic when it comes to Taiwan's main telecom, mostly because uh, the largest fixed broadband and one of the largest mobile um, telecom provider, the Zhonghua Telecom, um, is state-owned, right? So it, it, it is um, not entirely state-owned now, but it has its roots in uh, the provider of the what we could just call broadband as human right, which is a very, uh, it has a long history. So it is tasked with uh, serving the disadvantages areas where it operates at economic loss because we believe in uh, broadband as human right. So if you have one of the largest telecoms operating using this philosophy, then net neutrality, you, you don't just work, you, you don't, you don't just, um, you know, think of it in, in, in terms that will, uh, like, um, you know, a higher competition rate is better for the consumer and things like that. Of course, I can make all those uh, right-wing capitalist arguments as well, but those arguments just don't, arise here in Taiwan uh, back in the fixed broadband days. Now, of course, people are talking about it a little, a little bit more, mostly because the U.S. is talking about it a lot, but then we, we just put some preventative uh, measures just in case people are going to have non-neutrality uh, services in the future. We're going to put some balancing um, text in the Digital Communication Act, but frankly speaking, that has never been a problem uh, here in Taiwan. Um, but I, I do follow the net neutrality conversation in the U.S. very closely. But um, I'm not going to say what I think about it here. So um, we're live streaming for one. So uh, why did the officials of the Thai Lai government tell the Taiwanese people to drink bloody with spoons, right? <laughs> so so that that's one of the things that I think we can find it in the COFAX database, right? So um, yeah, th there's various uh, versions of this around with spoons, uh, with chopsticks. That's the newest one. <laughs> and there, there's various other, right? And then now you you hear about the spaghetti noodles from me. But in in any case, um, yeah, there's various creative um, ideas being being just pondered about that they're, they're considering various alternatives. But truth to, to be told, um, first, um, the plastic straw thing, it, it is a really serious um, um, from the recycle or sustainable development uh, life underwater perspective, it is something serious. So uh, in the e-petition platform, we have many even senior high school students proposing and succeeding in uh, succeeding in getting 5,000 uh, counter signatures to address this issue. So it is something that the people has brought consensus on. And of course, it will also um, make a new uh, generation of innovators uh, who think about reusable um, materials for uh, making straws because it is a hard requirement uh, to, to drink bolati properly, right? Uh, with proper straws for many people. So alternative materials uh, will be will be talked about. Now, of course, there are, I think it is a legislator actually, it is not a Thai government, but in any case, there's a, there was a legislator that shared that when she's drinking, I think, hot bubble tea um, in a cup, she uses a spoon. I think I did see that news somewhere. But just like any other misinformation, um, it just the idea, you know, took it live on its own and it become very viral. And and the newest version now becomes, you know, the the president, you know, tells people to use spoon to drink cold iced bubble tea. But it doesn't really work like this, right? So so I think the the good thing about a complete uh, freedom of speech is that we see various very interesting memes, but. Uh, and, and it's just that, we just treat them as very interesting memes. Okay. Right, how does an edited re recording and transcript um, um, equal uh, radical transparency? Uh, I wouldn't say that it's equal, I would say that it's ex approximating, asymptotically approximating two words. Right, so, so no, but it, it's, it's, it's true, because you, you can't, if, you, if I start saying, you know, everybody who talks with me is going to get live streamed, the, the result is nobody talks with me, right? So, so I think this is um, like if I ask everybody who posts on Slido uh, to step in front of the camera and state your question for the record, nobody wants to ask questions anymore, right? So <laughs> I, I think um, it is very important to make people feel safe. 
and that they control the degree that they want to share. So this is part of the idea of data agency. And um, the editing is actually a collaborative thing. So if there's someone who c comes in after a meeting, edits their um, for the record transcript so that they say something completely opposite, then everybody else in the same meeting is going to discover that because I personally review every word <laughs> before publishing it, right? So, so nobody would want to do that to, to the minister. So um, it is more like when people are having a discussion, maybe we're bantering, maybe we talk about some t in jokes, maybe we talk about something that is unrelated to the issue at, at hand, but we're just sharing our personal experiences. But in any case, we have a strict definition of what is uh, allowed to be edited away, and like many other PDIS uh, ideas, you can get it in visit.pedis.tw. So <laughs> if you go to visit pedis.tw, then you see the uh, full principle for handling official visits to Digital Minister Audrey Tom. And um, you can see that basically a drafted transcript, it could be correcting typos or deleting information that is by law confidential prior to the transcript being made public. So it is basically still subject to the FOIA rules. If, it, if something it should be public in the first place according to FOIA, then the people cannot just modify it or delete it away. But they can arguably say that this thing is non-FOIA compatible. I just talk about some of my personal information unrelated to the public interest and things like that, and, and I also confront them on it. So this back and forth process is basically a way to get people of thinking about how it's useful to work in a public by default mode. But it is, of course, not ultimate transparency, because if I do that, nobody wants to talk about me um, anymore. Someone asked me, how do I have a link for everything? Well, th well, there, there's um, the, the reason is that um, I think about 60% of the questions I get asked already, right? So uh, when I first um, get um, this question for the first time, I may need to think about it, but then I go back and I look at a, a transcript made automatically from the live stream and then make a page containing my answer and then I give it a short, um, like when people ask about PO, PDIS, TW, like the participation offices, then my team just makes a PO, PDIS, PTW. So <laughs> the next time when people say, okay, what are participation offices? I can just say, okay, PO, PDIS, TW, that's, that's your answer, right? So <laughs> basically, I mean, this walking frequently asked question system that <laughs> just get what people are interested at the moment about the government and then crowdsource uh, within the government about a appropriate um, conversation material about it. And I'm very happy that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is uh, learning from this me method. So you, some of you may know that Ministry of Foreign Affairs maintained this taiwan.gov.tw domain name. But now uh, for every uh, major science and technology policy like AI Taiwan or Smart Taiwan or whatever, then we have a, its own subdomain like AI Taiwan GOVTW that just talks about how Taiwan plans to develop AI and how those regulatory co-creation like with the tricycles uh, work here. And so uh, you can link to most of it, uh, starting from Smart Taiwan GOVTW, which uh, then links uh, to AI Taiwan, to Asia Silicon Valley, to the biomedical industry, and things like that. And um, there's one thing I would like to share, um, is that if you link from here, it goes to biomed.taiwangovtw because the yi cai, the medical instrument uh, industry, is large in Taiwan and it's not strictly speaking part of biology. It's not part of bio Taiwan. But if you're uh, in a rush and just want to type out the address as I'm doing here, uh, you can also do bio Taiwan GOVTW and it goes to exactly the same website. Um, so so th I think this illustrates the inclusiveness of, uh, of the the idea of PETIS. Basically, whenever the uh, Minister of Health and Welfare and the Biology, um, you know, Action Center and whatever, they, they, they really spent a week debating whether this should be called Bio Taiwan or Biomed Taiwan. But the thing of digital resources online is that the space is infinite. Why don't we have both? So, so you can go to um, the Bio Taiwan or Biomed Taiwan, it's exactly the same thing, right? So, <laughs> right, so just by engaging in Q&A sessions, that's cross like this and find out whatever that I don't have a ready link for afterwards and asking the PDS people whether you would like to prepare a, a one pager and then we end up having one pager for most of the things that people are interested about. 
a smartphone handheld addiction a serious issue in Taiwan? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so um, that's part of the reason why my personal phone is, is this thing, because you, you can't run Twitter or Instagram or Line or whatever on this thing. It is really just a feature phone. It, it's good for um, calling people and taking SMS and maybe taking a low resolution photo and that's it. So <laughs> and, and because otherwise I, I do get like physically addicted to myself. So so I, I need all the help I can get. It could be through hardware or uh, I have this um, installed on my all my computers and I sincerely recommend it to you. It's called Facebook Feed Eradicator. Uh, it works for Chrome, for Firefox, for Safari, uh, and basically if you install this, um, then it does what it says on the tin. It eradicates the news feed uh, from Facebook, but you can still use Facebook very usefully, right? But you have to use it like a browser, like you only go to the page you care about, the search uh, keywords you care about, the uh, conversation you care about, but you don't ever see one thing that is pushed upon you without you expecting it. So that is the main thing of addiction. And, and just by cutting this away from our dopamine, dopamine cycle, uh, it, it's very, very useful as a cure for Facebook addiction, just in case you have this problem. But <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so in the, in, instead of uh, the news feed, it shows you some very inspiring quote about from Adler, or from Lao Tzu, or from Confucius, or from somewhere else. Yeah, but, but you know, it, it's, it's just a matter of time saver. I save about one hour every day just by installing this <laughs> Facebook uh, feed eradicator. So for, for every technology, we have a um, idea of data agency and also agency of one's uh, attention, right? One's, one's mind. And so I think it's essential that we popularize um, this uh, idea that you can, you know, gain back your attention just by uh, using hardware or other software forms uh, to uh, ward away the addiction. But critical thinking, I think, is still very important. So we have some uh, 22 minutes more. Um, a, a few, uh, where the food? Yeah, that's a Cheng Xu Dong Yi. That's a <laughs> very important question. <laughs> is it just outside or you're going to the dinner somewhere? <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, a few days ago, some of Taiwan's high school graduates just finished their second entry exam. Uh, why do some of Taiwan's youth have to face uh, such a stress? We're, we're working on it. Um, the, the new curriculum uh, will drastically change the relationship between the students and the uh, basic education system and the universities. Starting next year, we're going to move uh, the Xuan uh, Xiu, like uh, voluntary selection of curriculum um, idea, into the senior high, mostly because of the lack of um, number of uh, population uh, growth. Um, so we have a lot more empty uh, classrooms in senior high. So instead of just reducing the staff, we instead introducing uh, the uh, university's system of Xuanxiu Zhidu and, and also Xiaoding Xuanxiu, Xiaoding Bixiu. Basically, the uh, school gets to declare itself, for example, they're going to focus on philosophy. Uh, some schools already do. And, and there's schools that's going to focus on uh, e-sports. For. So basically, they just attract the student using whatever the student is interested in. I'm sure that there's people like me who enjoy both esport and philosophy. But in any case, they can uh, just compose their, uh, their their schedule by themselves. And the main idea we're proposing is that they don't need to go to the college right after uh, the senior high, and that there's sufficient senior high in various different um, um strengths like the Jishu Gaozhong and Putong Gaozhong for the uh, technical and academic ones and we make it very easy for you to enroll into one the first year in the senior high and then switch to a different track if you find that you're interested in academic or in uh, technology in practice apply science after all. So this is going to be a very large uh, change in addition to the already underway experimental um, education act and we expect that it will um, massively lower the stress uh, of students and increase the stress of the parents. 
um, because <laughs> the, the, the school no longer offer a, a linear uh, progression anymore. The student can, uh, after the reform, uh, choose to engage with the university two years after graduating from senior high and enroll only for one or two years and then go, go outside to do something, maybe voluntary work, maybe start an enterprise or whatever. But after a couple of years, they found that they need some academic training after all and they go back to college and it can take up to 10 years to finish a college degree. So it will be very different and all thanks to the um, you know, uh, shrinking population. So we have more choices, but with the same constitutionally protected um, education budget and that is what you get is a lot of flexibility. Uh, do I play League of Legend, Le Legends? Uh, no, I don't play, uh, sorry. Um, I, I'm more into <laughs> turn-based gaming. So, so I do play XCOM 2, and uh, actually I play NAHAC for like three decades or something. Yeah, but, uh, but also um, like many turn-based uh, Battle of West knows, uh, Civilization from 1 to 6 um, and, and things like that. So um, I, I'm not like very agile uh, and despite uh, how I use this um, iPad, but I'm, I'm not very f uh, fast uh, with keyboard-based uh, real-time responses, so I prefer to take my time. So most of the e-sport, uh, quote-unquote, that I participate are mind sports. That, that does not, it's not like Tetris, like you have to respond really fast, but you do have to, uh, how about a Total War franchise? <laughs> right, well we can, we can start a, a, a conversation about e-gaming right here. So um, if you go to e-sport, that Pete is that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they say P is subdomain for every topic, <laughs> right? You, you, you will see that the, the eSport, it used to be that eSport athletes were orphaned. Uh, and the cultural ministry think that it's an economic thing, and the economic ministry think that it's a uh, physical education, TU, part of Ministry of Education, and the MOE think that it's nowhere near TU, it should be a cultural thing. So um, nobody really wants to take charge, and the eSport athletes, they don't enjoy the same benefits uh, of uh, alternative military service, of FISA, of um, various other um, education-related benefits and things like that, so we, we basically just this is actually our first uh, fully accountable open government case. We start with the public hearing with the eSport athletes um, just outlining whatever the gripes that they have with the existing system. But then we started working with all the different ministries who are initially very opposing this idea until that I found this um, leverage because some of the Ministry of Culture people um, in charge of this, they were um, like not really professional but amateur uh, Go uh, players, like Wei Qi players. And I, I started telling them that most Wei Qi players, most Go players uh, around the world are now practicing online and that most Go players now work in teams or in clubs and that uh, AI actually plays Wei Qi better than humans uh, nowadays, which uh, taken together means that Wei Qi is an e-sport now. Um, so, um, and, and it really radically changes their, their perspective perspective about things like the, the thing that they, they were uh, taught as kids, like Chantong Wenhua or whatever. Uh, it is mostly an eSport now and whatever um, LL players or Total War players or whatever, they, uh, whatever the way people enjoy, uh, those LL players should also enjoy. And, and so based on this leverage and this argument, which is, I totally did not invent, I, I took it from PTT, uh, it's a large forum, uh, just like Reddit here in, in Taiwan. So the good thing about public everything to um, to the um, internet is that people in the various different forums they they have various mi mimetic uh, variations about uh, the thing that we're talking about and I just harvest the ones that are most innovative and the most um, capable of changing people's minds uh, into the, the meetings and so um, the ministry people all think that you know the internet people they're so creative and so civilized that's because I only take those things into internet meetings but uh, after a few rounds of meetings they actually set on a, on a definition that they can all agree with and so all the three ministries now can engage with eSport people um, you know on, on the same terms as they engage with other mind sport people and so that's about uh, total world franchise um, I, I do I do play chess uh, it's pineapple um, pizza acceptable wow <laughs>
It's a very deep question. Uh, <laughs> depends like like where on earth you are, right? <laughs> that the question is going to differ based on the time zone. Uh, the the right answer would diff differ. So. Um, What's my philosophy of life? What is a personal goal or dream? What makes you want to come back and work in the Ministry of Taiwan? Right. So um, that's a great question. So um, my personal philosophy is heavily informed by my um, own experience as a as a child. Um, I was born with this um, uh, uh, heart defect. Def def uh, defect that basically um, most doctors said that if I survive till uh, I'm 12 years old, uh, then I can get a surgery and maybe it will be cured. But there's also a 50% chance that I don't live till 12 or something. So this is something that I get repeatedly told when I was like three years old or four years old, um, and I don't remember that, but it's what my parents told me. But but that that actually uh, gave me um, this. Um, philosophy that says basically I need to publish everything and contribute everything I can contribute um, every time that I go to bed. <clears throat> so uh, like till now, um, like every day when I go to bed, I make sure that my inbox is zero. So I practice inbox zero with a zeal, right? So <laughs> basically um, every email I just reply um, without expecting a, a actually a follow-up um, like close to 11 uh, p.m. or something like that. So I have to uh, reply to all my email and my uh, to-do list uh, managed with only focus. The inbox is also cleared um, by midnight and all, all this just because I can convince myself that in the off chance that I don't wake up the next day I can rest in peace because I publish everything that I can uh, to the world and I just relinquish uh, whatever um, claim uh, to it. So it <coughs> informs my work also. So for the past decade or so, uh, this is the work that I help maintaining. It's called Mengdian, um, um, the Moe Dictionary. It is a pretty good resource. Uh, you can uh, learn about <coughs> the kanji, uh, how the uh, engineering is called in Minan and Hakka, and there's also a means in indigenous uh, versions and you can also learn about uh, the various um, idioms um, and so on and, and it's I think very useful as a language uh, learners tool and um, but the important thing is that uh, in, as with most of my work I just say you know I re relinquish all the copyright uh, laws including all the close and nearby laws uh, so that including the rights of database right and uh, attribution rights so basically I don't have an attachment to my um, attribution so you can take this contribution this whole Moe dictionary and say that you did it and I would not sue you uh, because I, I only believe in uh, contribution I think what uh, people gives is much more uh, important than what one retains because I have this in very incredibly short lifespan um, horizon, right? Anything I keep, I only keep it for the day and then I just publish it. So that's my main philosophy. And if you practice philosophy long enough, that actually is very helpful because then I wake up a, a new person, right? I, I can innovate in whatever direction and all my debts are paid uh, the, for the previous night already. So I don't have to uh, work in one particular way, and there is very little inertia um, in this way of working. So this is my philosophy of, of life. And so, consequently, my personal goal is just for the next 10 minutes answer as much questions as possible. So, incredibly short-sighted. <laughs> That's because um, this is not just for this conversation, but it's also being live streamed and put on record so that people can follow up with even more questions and even inspire people to think um, in various different ways. Right, so um, I'm not going to read aloud the questions anymore because there's insufficient time for that. So um, if you work in a purely voluntary basis, there is no challenges at all. This is a nice pro tip. If, if you don't give command, uh, nor take command and work with only voluntary association as an anarchist uh, does. Um, there is no um, obstacles because people just come to me if they're ready to work radically transparent way, if they're ready to engage with the public. And if things fail, if we don't get useful information, if we don't get useful input, then we just document why it's not going to work this way. It's just like, like Thomas Edison said, you know, uh, I, I discovered 1,000 ways of why things don't work. Right? So, so this is a, always a positive uh, regard if you can just publish all, everything that happens along the way. So this is 
the, the main idea, just working as a kind of public hub or um, facilitating space, uh, and then there really is no challenge at all. People bring their challenges, I help them to find the people who are working on the same problem. Uh, I try to make sure that they have the resource they need to tackle this problem and publish their failures as they often do, uh, if, and if they have small successes, I celebrate it, but, but that, that's it, that's my work. So there is no personal agenda for me uh, to, to do things, which, is, which makes it very hard you know, if people ask, like, what are your goals? So nowadays I just say, you know, the, exactly the same as sustainable development goals because it saves me a lot of uh, explanation and it is true that the SDGs are self-coherent in a way that is most likely when people bring their ideas to me it correspond to SDG in one way or the other. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think um, in the public uh, sphere Especially, um, so there's another link, the EYP, this, <laughs> which is a uh, system that I set up, it's called Sandstorm, um, which is just exactly like the Google Apps, right? So you can see the collaborative spreadsheet, collaborative bookmarks, multi-user, um, document editor, Dropbox, like file storage, there's a chat room, and basically a lot of different things. And every day I wake up and um, I just look at this shared Kanban, which is uh, Trello, and because of the radical transparency precondition, I cannot look at state secrets. So at any point in my talk, I can always just open our team's internal Kanban without uh, worrying about state secrets because um, I, I don't even know about this, right? So um, then I can just automatically see what people are working on and what, what, what help they need and things like that. So everybody in PDIS uh, and who work with PDIS are working in this kind of working out loud way. And it's relevant to this question because once you have an alternative, a viable alternative that's free software that doesn't require uh, subscription fees, that never gets out of date just because the vendor decides to modify a feature and so on, then you're in a much stronger position to negotiate with multinationals. Uh, we still use proprietary software like Slido, which is uh, free in cost but not free of charge. But Slido also knows that we always have an alternative ready <laughs> if they start to have a data policy or privacy policy that doesn't agree with our philosophy. So we can then engage the multinationals and the large uh, corporations and use some of their uh, service mainly just for uh, communicating with the public instead of internally. But then whenever they change their privacy policy or change their data retention policy, we always have a plan. Be. And as a result, they don't tend to change their um, policy on this. So I think this is very important to always have a backup plan uh, in the free software world. Uh, well, I think this, um, so, huh. so basically we, we don't do um, e-elections. Uh, not because we cannot, but we choose not. Uh, we, we do do uh, online uh, petitioning and uh, country signature and participatory um, budgeting. Like in Taipei, there's this I voting thing going on. But the things being voted on is always uh, the ideas from other citizens. So as in participatory budgeting, or at most, um, you know, the priorities of how things are chosen, like in Slido, like the one you're voting, determine the time I'm going to spend on each question. But it's not about voting in people. Um, first, because um, it is much harder to guarantee the, the correctness and auditableness of the, the machine records. And second, that it, it creates an incentive if you um, use tempering to get the right person in office, that person then can you know, mutate the rules so that it becomes even more uh, likely for their faction to uh, win the election afterwards. And paper for all its faults, uh, it's very easy to audit. And we also allow people to live stream uh, this whole tallying uh, process. And so in a national election, you can just see people in different parties and independents just live stream the tallying process. And so far, even though cryptographically speaking, I can name a few algorithms that has the same property. Um, we can't yet convince all the different parties people that it has the same strong property. And so because of this, before we have this cryptographic literacy um, to, to all the different uh, parties, the paper audit trail is here to stay. But we're uh, working actively to 
enable, for example, uh, indigenous people who want to vote in their voting booths closer to where they work instead of where they're born, or uh, when people are uh, proposing idea for a national referendum, which is by paper ballot, but the proposing and counter signature uh, period because it doesn't take anything away. Uh, that could be done electronically. So this is a um, the stance that we're taking uh, at the moment. My preferred social media site. Uh, my preferred so social media is called Mastodon. It's very obscure, so uh, right. But but you may want to check it out. Um, so it is like Twitter, but um, it is you can set it set up one very easily yourself, and you can have a different policy for image and video retention or whatever. And it's all federated, so you can federate into different communities. Like uh, for the moment, I think a lot of so based on different uh, points in time, uh, different continents are awake, but they're all actually running in their own local uh, instances. So it is a uh, Twitter-like system, but without the central control of Twitter. Uh, I think this is a one of the things that is going to uh, be a viable alternative to the kind of uh, overt um, data policies that is going to leave a lot of people unhappy for huge uh, concentrated social media sites. It's much easier if you and a group of people who think like you uh, can decide what the policy is like for your Twitter like Mastodon instance and then you can start diplomatic work and federate with like-minded uh, instances and if you don't like their um, ideas um, for example, um, you know, um, nudity or whatever, then you can just stop federating that part of the content. I think this is a much more participatory way uh, for social media engagement. And for this, um, yeah, we're, we're, so disadvantaged use is, is such a broad term, but what we're trying to do is, is not um, building them as disadvantaged, but rather discover uh, the advantages uh, that, they, that they have. This is um, the main idea. So I'm going to take a couple minutes and share with you an example. So um, this is a social enterprise called uh, uh, and they systematically look at disadvantaged people, like for example the Xi Hanler, people with Down syndrome, and then they work with them and discover that they're actually awesome painters and illustrators, and then uh, try to just get people understand that they're good at things that we're not good at. Uh, and there's also, they work with blind people also. There's a social enterprise here, it's international called Dialogue in the Dark, uh, that lets people have uh, like consensus training and collaboration camps and whatever in a completely dark environment and led by um, young and aspiring blind facilitators who are very confident and after a few hours working with those blind facilitators, you will understand that we are the disadvantaged people and they're the strong people in, in such environment that uh, makes it much easier for people to be vulnerable and share uh, their personal ideas. And they are now also working with uh, vendors on wheelchairs and identified the various uh, problems that they have that results in people seeing them as disadvantaged and then work with different communities of people to remodel their mobile station so that it looks like a very hip mobile station and the latest iteration even have a huge screen that can double um, as a kind of umbrella-ish thing uh, that can fold on top and they started a crowdfunding campaign and of course very quickly get a million anti dollars, but the idea is that the crowdfunders are, are also supporters of their um, ideation, so that they can say that you know those, it's not wheelchair anymore, right? It's mobile stations uh, can be Wi-Fi hotspots. They can also charge very quickly if your uh, phone runs out of power, and they can also host their community's umbrella and so on. So the the whole thing is that to make people think of people in wheelchairs not as disadvantaged people that we need to connect to the digital society, but a unique mobile station pro service provider that fulfills a need in the society and in the community that nobody else can do so um, very easily as they, as they are. And so I think that is our main idea of inclusion, right? It's not just about diversity, about people appearing on the stage and getting to a party. The inclusion is that everybody dance in a different way and that we can see their unique contributions uh, to the society. Um, right, so we, we always get this question. Um, so, <laughs> right, um, so um, 
<coughs> so I will state for the record that, <coughs> that we get invaded practically every minute. Uh, so uh, we, we get uh, cyber, um, so the, the DPP's uh, homepage just gets replaced with some uh, manga, right, a couple of days ago. Um, and not to mention that all the system that we're hosting, all the um, internal systems, um, every couple of days I just get an email saying, okay, yesterday there was just, you know, 1500 <laughs> right uh, attempted connections to DDoSR service and things like that so so this is not a hypothetical thing uh, the disruption it could be of course from PLC or from other uh, sources we don't have a um, a way to say for sure that from which IP addresses or from which botnet uh, the controllers are. It could be you know from us, for all I know. But uh, what we're seeing is that there's a lot of uh, attempted um, infiltrations and uh, cyber warfare um, that is just going on every day. So yeah, w I, I do think that we have good enough technology and all the system that internal use that I just show you, like Sandstorm, we engage with white hat hackers and like like they they want like top. I think uh, second place at DEF CON, like really uh, serious white hat hackers, and to just attack our system uh, every day, every week, and uh, for a prolonged period, try to social engineer our passwords, and, and just let us know uh, where our defense in depth uh, falls down, and actively repair the system, and occasionally uh, the president also meets them, so that our white hat hackers feel very proud to serve the people in the country, instead of going to the dark side, and I think this is, <laughs> this is very, very very important to to maintain a, a positive relationship um, with the the you know Jedi's right with the with the white hat hackers uh, because then we can say that IoT cybersecurity and other AI related cybersecurity is not just an industry in Taiwan but something that we have real world experience uh, working every day on those assaults. All right, so that's all the things that I can answer for now. I'm uh, sorry that I can't answer them all, but uh, thank you for the excellent question. Thank you. Very thank you to the Chief Minister, Tang Feng, for giving us such a rich and enriching presentation and interaction. But we thank the Chief Minister, Tang Feng, for giving us such a warm and welcoming welcome. 那我們最後我們邀請呃呂副委員長為我們進行總結。非常謝謝我們行政院我們的唐鳳政務委員. I want to thank uh Digital Minister Tang Feng for delivering such a very interesting and very impressed and very inspiring speech for us. Shall we uh give uh the Minister Tang another round of Big plus to thank. Thank you.